A lot of people don't know you got the world's most famous tattoo, right? It's been shown in hundreds of movies. It was badass. Women are attracted to it. Rihanna licked it? Yeah. Oh, I'm jealous. You got this uh, great tat. What is that of? Well, you must have met people who have had you tattooed on them. Actually, I have. <laughs> but the weirdest one was Danny Trejo. He started working, and of course, he landed on the movie that I, my first movie that I did. You were a criminal. Yeah. They told me, you're gonna meet this prisoner that is now an actor, and he's, I was a little bit afraid. He ran towards me and ripped his shirt off. And I showed her my tattoo, I said, I knew you before, I knew you. That's a picture of you, honey. And sure enough, there was a, a picture of a woman that looks exactly like me. Salma then did something that surprised even Danny. She invited him home. Salma soon learned that Danny wasn't just an ex-criminal. He was the most feared inmate in America's most dangerous prison. San Quentin. Never know what to expect. Yeah. Control be advised, I've got about six on six. I've seen inmates stabbed in the neck, throats sliced. This was the only prison in the state to use a gas chamber. Some of the most violent people in the world. Manson may have been responsible for as many as 35 killings. Believe me, if I started murdering people, there'd be none of you left. Danny was so feared that even Charles Manson asked him for protection. It was hard to believe that he had been that person. Before his life of crime, Danny was a boy who liked to play with girls. My aunts and girl cousins adored me. We did everything separately from the men. We played make-believe and dress-up and played with dolls. One day, my Uncle Rudy came in the girl's bedroom, saw me in a dress, and went ballistic. We Trejos had to be masculine in every way, at every moment. And all of a sudden, I move in with my dad. So shit really changed. It's 1951. The Trejo family are having a barbecue. Everyone is avoiding the fact that six-year-old Danny has been locked in the car. My aunts wanted to help, but they were too scared to get involved. So everyone continued picnicking while I watched. Danny had learned that being a man meant never showing weakness. So he stayed quiet in the scorching heat. I started falling asleep or passing out, but I fought it so hard I leaned back against the seat, then curled up on the floor. I was losing consciousness. But suddenly, someone came to help. My Uncle Gilbert was the only person who wasn't scared of my dad. Though Danny's father had told everyone to leave Danny in the car, Uncle Gilbert pulled him out. My dad was yelling at him about it, and Gilbert told him to lighten up. He was a hero. I prayed to God, let me be like that. In the years that followed, Uncle Gilbert offered Danny something his parents didn't. I can remember asking my mom, she was on the phone going, hey mom, she goes, shut the two shit on the phone, you stupid. And I asked my dad, dad, hey, what, what is Now my Uncle Gilbert, I would say, hey Gilbert, he goes, hey, hold on. What do you want, Mule? But there was a reason Uncle Gilbert always had time for Danny. Everybody knew. My mom and dad did everything to try to keep me away from him, but you know. My uncle always had a roll of money like that, always. The girls, the car, the money, I want that. Whatever Gilbert did, I followed. If he played football, I would have been an athlete. It just so happened he was a drug dealer gangster. When I realized Gilbert was doing robberies, I didn't think it was bad. I thought it was kind of heroic. Uncle Gilbert was the only man showing Danny the compassion that he felt as a young kid. But when Danny turned eight, his first crime was a crime of compassion. We were walking around one night and heard the cows mooing. They sounded like they were suffering, so we climbed over a big fence and set them all free. 
They couldn't wait to get the fuck out of there. Those cows must have been in heaven for a few hours. Because dairies are under the jurisdiction of the Food and Drug Administration, the feds were all over the place. By the time Danny was 12, he discovered a dark side to his hero. He was no longer like this cool Gilbert. He was like crazy. I seen him over this. And had my grandfather's syringe. My grandfather was a diabetic. He said, get out of here. I said, no, give me some. Give me some or I'm gonna tell. That's how young he was. Give me some or I'm gonna tell. He says, hold this. So I'm holding this belt for him like this. It's a glass syringe. So when the needle registered, it does this little atomic bomb thing. And then, bam, he hits it. He says, let it go. And I let it go. And when I let it go, I seen this whole change come over him from this crazy to this home. He gave me a fix. A couple of drops of his cotton. And Next thing I remember, I was soaking wet, sitting outside my grandmother's yard, just, I'd overdosed. You're not thinking, oh, well, now I don't have to worry about school, I don't have to worry about parents, I don't have to worry about this, nothing. It's just gone. And then all I remember is hearing the ice cream truck and getting some ice cream. Danny became exactly like his uncle. A few years later, Danny finds himself on a bus, driving him to a place people call the arena. When you're driving up that wall in Quinton and you see that gun tower right in front, you know that once you go in there, you're not coming out. This is the big house. The minute the bus stops, the tension starts. You hear this engine. And all it is is everybody talking. If you've ever been next to somebody that's insanely angry, 4,000 guys that angry, that kind of rage, that's the tension in San Quentin. You're either alpha or you're not. Someone's either gonna say, what size shoes do you got on? And if you don't crack them in their head that first second, you're soft. Danny's for sure an alpha guy. I had a, a mentor, I had a teacher who had already been here. My he, uncle, he taught me everything I was gonna need to know in prison. Some people get in the library to do time. Some people, you know, do crossword puzzles. Some people play chess. I trained. That's what kept me sane. He was a 1966, 67, and 68 San Quentin champion. Danny became so good at protecting himself that he started doing it for others. We had this little protection ring going. If you think somebody's after you and you tell us, we'll take care of it. I feel sorry for kids that all of a sudden just end up in juvenile hall and don't understand that if you get in a fight, try to bite somebody immediately so that they know, wait a minute, this guy doesn't want to fight, he wants to eat me. At times, you, you kind of realize what you're becoming. Playing dominoes with a lot of people around us, and it's a big game, a lot of money game, and I'm killing. I set the spinner, it's double five. You know, it's like, I got you, you guys are mine. Boom, 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 and it's boom. This guy falls on the table and he's just bleeding. Somebody just hit him bad. Everybody started getting away and I'm screaming, no, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. I'm screaming, I got a fives, I got five. I remember I was in my cell and I, I still had my dominoes. And the thought, what the f am I becoming? You know, this guy's dying. You know, he had a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, maybe kids. And I'm screaming about my fives. He knew that day that that he was he was changed. He wasn't, you know, Danny anymore. He was he was 
the monster. Danny remembered the boy he once was, the boy who cared for others. I sat in the hole realizing that my life was over, that like, I'm either gonna change my life or spend the rest of my life in prison. That night, Danny decided he was going to live his way, not the way Uncle Gilbert had taught him. I didn't think of it as reforming. I thought about keeping a promise from now on. You have got to do things for other people and not expect any kind of reward. Three years later, Danny was released back into the world, claiming to be a changed man. He came back here to this house. He walked up to the metal gate and he said, my grandmother opened the door but she didn't unlock the screen door when she saw him. I said, Mom, can I stay a couple of days? My parole plans fell through. And my mom turned to my dad, who was sitting right there, and said, Dan, Danny wants to know if he can stay a couple of days. And I, my dad said, yeah, tell him yes, without looking up from the TV. Walked into my bedroom, and I'm sitting in my bedroom, and I'm rocking and thinking, this is the same bedroom I was in when I was 13 years old. You're a tough-ass convict, 26 years old, arm robber, and you're at mommy's. Your dad didn't even say hello. He doesn't really want you here. My dad hated tattoos, and I wanted to get back at him. Got up, and I went, and I sat in front on the ottoman in front of his television set. I had taken off my shirt. I got that big tattoo on my chest, and I was just getting ready to say, hey, what's up with you? you know, my mom comes out, perfect timing. Mijo, you want some cookies and milk? Danny put his anger aside and started living life his way. I can remember the first person I tried to help. And I seen this old lady pulling out her trash. And I walked over to her, never forget her words. No me robas, Danny! She never took her eyes off me. She's like, because she knew I was going to run to the garage and yeah. get a lawnmower steel. Brought her can out again. No one trusted the guy who had once robbed the entire neighborhood. But Danny didn't quit. He learned how to help other people. He started giving out his number, and people would just call him up. Danny got sober and found a decent job. But one day, he got an unexpected visitor. Gilbert holds up in a new Lincoln. He's only been out of the joint about two weeks. So I got everything going for him. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking like a escape from a Vietnamese prison. I'm like, I'm just <laughs> covered in grease. I'm working in a wrecking yard. And he asked me, what the f are you doing? And I said, shut up, Gilbert, I'm working. Said, I know, but this is embarrassing, home shit, you know. We played in dirt all day. And, and he goes, here. And he gave me two quarters of heroin, and he gave me $1,000. He put $1,000 there, and he said, you know what, looks Get yourself together, get out of Start, you know, go ahead and work for me. I got the bag, I'm doing real well. I had worshiped Gilbert since I was a kid. He'd been my role model. Gilbert, f you, I can't, man. And the first time I ever walked away from him. But I went to the back and I was just sitting there thinking, God. From that point on, Danny never fell under the influence of Gilbert again. He overdosed and died. My cousin found him. That was like his big brother. Even though Danny had veered from that path, you know, his, he just loved Gilbert to death. You know, he just, that was his everything. After Gilbert's death, Danny found himself acting like a convict once again. Fresh off his hit movie debut, 23-year-old director Robert Rodriguez is casting his next movie, starring Antonio Banderas and newcomer Salma Hayek. You and Salma develop a very nice give and take. It's gorgeous. Easy and, uh, and fantastic. I love Antonio, but Antonio something was like, hit me with the guitar, he has it, and he's like turning, and it's like, Antonio! <laughs> I needed a silent assassin who had these knives. And so I told the casting director, find me somebody who just looks really menacing because he's not going to have any dialogue. And then he walked in and I was like, holy shit, who's that? 
dude, he looks creepy as f I met Selma Hayek, she's like stunningly beautiful. You just want to stab yourself in the eyes and never look at anybody else. They told me you're gonna meet this prisoner that is now an actor and he's, I was a little bit afraid. And I showed her my tattoo, I said, that's a picture of you, honey. But Salma didn't react the way Danny expected. People are afraid of you, Danny. We're on a movie set, people are afraid of you because we have this look. I was hating myself, I started hating myself. Once a criminal, always a criminal. Once a criminal, always a criminal. Once a criminal, always a criminal. We have this idea of how things are supposed to be and how they're gonna be, but we forget all the hurt and disaster and riots that we've caused. I forget all that stuff, you know, I know. But it was Danny who had misjudged Selma. Day before Thanksgiving, she calls me, and this is like almost two months later. I, she called with the movies already, called me and said, Danny, would you like to come to a Thanksgiving dinner? Would you? Yeah. And so I, I went over, to, she had a family Thanksgiving dinner and she invited me. I, she didn't know that I went to the bathroom, I was like crying. I couldn't believe that. She's so wonderful. She's so nice. Unbelievable. Unbelievably nice, man. If you did something wrong, don't go down because of it. Your mistake, it's a valuable tool for growth. In the years that followed, the world finally saw who Danny really was. Actor Danny Trejo played the role of a real-life hero today. Security video caught the accident as the SUV goes through the intersection and gets T-boned by the other car. I just want to cry. I just know, I just knew how, how scared he was. I went to grab him and I seen he was special needs. Special needs kids, especially autistic, don't like to be touched. So uh, I said, hey, wait, use your superpowers and grab me. And so he reached out, right? And then that way I could hold him and I brought him out. The boy and grandmother soon reunited. Three people taken to the hospital after the crash, but luckily none seriously hurt, thanks in no small part to Trejo. Grandma was hurt and he goes, Superpowers, Grandma. Super and uh, 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 I, I, you know, like, when he made the decision that he wasn't going back and that he was going to be different, he had to completely break that down. And now I think he knows who he is completely. People flew him around the United States to speak. Well, one of the most impressive motivational speakers you'll ever hear is Danny Trejo. One day, that's all I got. All I got is one day. Do you understand? Now, how do I want to live today? He literally drives around stopping people on the street and giving them toys. To be my friend, you got to have thermal underwear, socks, and t-shirts in your trunk of your car to pass out to the homeless. He dedicated his life to rehabilitating others. Trejo Tacos is about giving back. We're starting a foundation for autism. I think he really has seen the value of life. Everything good that has happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. The town that he terrorized in his youth now has a mural of him because of all the good that he did that outweighed everything. So that mural on the wall don't only represent him, it represents a lot of people that changed their lives. It's hope. I can evolve. I can change. I can dream now, and it's okay. <laughs>